My name is Mr. Rouse. Good morning, children. I understand that you will be learning about the Second World War and looking particularly at children who were evacuees. My wife had more to do with evacuees as she remembers how they turned up at her school to be chosen by the adults who were going to care for them. They turned up with their little suitcases and their gas masks in a little box, as you probably know. She knows that many of the evacuees kept in contact after the war ended, and I believe that some married and stayed in that area. I was a child myself in the war, so most of what I tell you will have been experienced by the evacuees as well. I shall speak about a number of things, and will give each area a title so that if you wish, you can stop the tape and discuss or ask questions about that section. My earliest memory. I am now 81 years of age, so understandably my memory of some things is diminishing. That means I forget from time to time. However, I think I was about four when I remember my mother standing at our front gate and my father walking down the street carrying a large suitcase. Just before he turned the corner and went out of sight, he turned and gave a final wave. My mother went back into our house, put her arms on our mantelpiece and cried pitifully. I imagine the parents of the evacuee children must have felt very much like my mother, and so would the children. My father was on his way to join the Royal Air Force, where apart from short periods of leave, that means holidays at home, he spent six years away from his family, that's my mother, sister and me. Our homes. Our homes then were not as comfortable as ours are today. No one had central heating, so they only heated the room you were living in, and this was done by having a coal fire. In the main room downstairs, and sometimes in bedrooms too, there were no carpets on the floor, only small mats everywhere, and everywhere else was covered in linoleum, which we call lino today, which in winter was very cold to the touch. So you can imagine how we felt getting out of bed in winter when our feet touched the ice-cold lino. Duvets were unheard of, but we had sheets and blankets instead. Houses had no washing machines, no refrigerators, no hoovers or Dysons or vacuum cleaners, so most things had to be done by hand. And in order to keep milk fresh, we used to have to put it in a, on a cold slab in a cupboard. We had no television, so we relied on the radio for all our information and news. The most important news was always at nine o'clock every evening. It would be read by a man who gave his name before reading it. For example, here is the nine o'clock news read by Frank Phillips, or here is the nine o'clock news read by John Snag or Alva Liddell. They would give a report on the events of the day, so we listened anxiously to learn how our forces were doing in the war. Many homes were lit by gaslight, some by oil lamps, but most did have electricity. Not all houses had a bathroom, so people who didn't used to use a large metal bath which had to be filled by hand as there were no taps on it. Showers were unheard of. Things were made more uncomfortable because of some of the rules that were enforced to keep our home safer. There was a complete blackout. This meant that every window had to have curtains that would not allow a single chink of light to be seen. Men called air raid wardens patrolled the streets at night to make sure that everyone obeyed the law. I want you to imagine that. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think of the silence. Don't make a sound. 
Just imagine the situation. Blackness. And then my sister opens the door to let the cat in. Get that light out! Would be, bol- would be shouted at us in the loud voice. Furthermore, every window had a tape crisscrossed over every pane of glass. Can you think why? Any torches that we used had to have a cardboard cover on the front with a little pinhole to allow just a tiny little bit of light to shine through. Car headlights had tape on them to stop the light shining through and the hood over the top of it as well. And of course there were no street lighting. Air raid shelters. Every house in the country was given an air raid shelter. There were two main types, Anderson shelter and the Morrison shelter. Every family had to build it themselves. The idea being that they would withstand a bomb blast better than a house. Families would make them as comfortable as possible inside as you might have to sleep in it. As children, we would go to bed at night, but when a siren went off indicating that an attack was about to happen, we would be rushed from our beds and carried into the shelter to wait until the all-clear siren was sounded. There was one snag with our shelter. My father never did anything by halves. If he put a shelf on a wall to hold a small radio, when he'd finished, I could have sat on it and the shelf wouldn't have fallen down. And he did the same thing with our shelter. Instead of building the shelter above the ground, my father dug down deep three or four feet into the earth and then built the shelter. But unfortunately, he'd forgotten at the top of our garden there was a stream and the stream flowed quite quickly and the garden sloped down towards the house. So when he went out a few days later to check what he had done, our aerate shelter was full of water, so we had to use the one next door throughout the war. Similarly, in the day, we would be in school when the siren would sound, and we would be taken to the cloakroom to wait for the all clear. We would then be told to run home before the next attack. When in our shelter we learned to recognise the different bomber engine noises, we could recognise German engines, we could recognise British engines. Why do you think we were taken to the cloakroom? Communication, telephones, iPads and so on. Put your hand up if you have a normal telephone in your home. I imagine that a lot of you have your hands up. Now put your hand up if you have a mobile phone or other ways of communicating, like a computer or iPad. I imagine that there are a lot more hands up now than there were the first time. I would think that nearly all of you have put your hand up at some time. Well, in those days, hardly anyone had a basic telephone. Professional people like doctors, dentists, and some businessmen did. Other than that, No homes had them at all. There were a few red telephone boxes dotted about the place. So the only way to guess a message sent was by using a telegram. You had to go to a post office and ask to send one. You had to pay for every word you sent. So obviously, messages were kept very, very short. The post office would then send that message to the nearest post office to where you lived. It would be written out and then delivered by, delivered by a telegram boy. Telegram boys had a special uniform and an ordinary simple bicycle with which they delivered the message. Sometimes the message would be good news. For example, Dad was coming home on leave. But very often it could be bad news. For example, someone had been killed in the war. So we, as children, would be worried when we saw the telegram boy riding down our street. We would watch anxiously to see which house he went to. Was it going to be good news or was it going to be bad news? I had a neighbour who had two sons. 
Both of them went into the Air Force. One of them was killed in Arnhem and the other one came home. Another neighbour of ours had six sons. All of them went to war and all of them returned. There was an awful lot of luck in what happened in war. Of the six boys that went, one of them was on a ship that was torpedoed and that happened to him twice but he survived by being on the other half that didn't sink. Generally, we fear the arrival of the telegram boys. Schooling. Schooling was quite different in those days. You started school at five years of age and you stayed in the same school until you left at 14. Our schooling was very interrupted. Very often you could be having normal lessons when the air raid warning siren would go off. We would be taken to the cloakroom until they all clear and then told to run home. We had a gas mask with us in school and we used to have gas mask drills, practicing putting them on and taking them off. I had a, a simple gas mask, but Mrs. Rouse had a very posh one. It was like Mickey Mouse's face. For the first time ever, school meals were introduced. They were cooked on the premises and cost two shillings a week. That's 20 pence in today's money. 20 pence for a whole week's dinners. My schooling was badly interrupted because my father was in the Royal Air Force and moved about the country. Sometimes we moved with him. So before the age of nine, I had, I had attended schools in Carlisle, that's in Scotland, and Carnarvon, that's in North Wales, before returning to my original school in Neath, South Wales. That was very difficult and very, very unsettling. Dig for victory. Dig for victory was a slogan which everyone is encouraged to obey. It meant that you could not use your garden to grow flowers, but you were encouraged to grow carrots, potatoes, lettuce and so on, because food supplies were very low. In some ways, we as children were a healthy generation because of our diet. There were no sweets, no chocolates to be had at all. We ate fresh food most of the time. Every person had a ration book, which you had to use in a particular shop. You were allocated amounts of food which you could buy, like eggs, cheese, butter, meat and so on. And again, you will be told examples of how much you could buy. When news of something became available in a shop, Everyone would rush to the shop to get some and gather there in a line, one behind the other. This was the origin of that British thing called a queue. Not all countries do this. The Blitz. Evacuees were removed from their normal homes to places considered to be safer, usually in quieter parts of the country. On the 7th of August 1940, intensive bombing in London began and was called the Blitz. Other parts of the country, such as Coventry, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham and Swansea, were very severely damaged. My mother used to say to me, your bedroom is very, very untidy. I'm going to have a Blitz in there. What she really meant was, she was going to rush in tidy up and rush out. In other words, a quick attack. Your teacher will write the German word Blitzkrieg, which is where we got the word from. He might also talk about Santa's reindeers, Donner and Blitzen. Games we played. Today, most children spend their times playing computer games and on the telephone, mobile telephones. We had never heard of such things, so our games were usually played in the street when possible. We played conkers. You will all know about that conker game, won't you? 
whipping top. This was a game where you made a top spin using a string. It, the idea was to keep it on its point and spinning for as long as possible. Hoop. A hoop was a large metal circular ring which we used to run alongside using a special hook or a stick. I often ran messages for my neighbours and sometimes I might go as far as a mile to another shop and if I showed any reluctance, reluctance to go, they'd say to me, well take your, take your hoop with you and off I'd go running along the road with a hoop on the end of my stick. Hopscotch was played mainly by girls but occasionally by boys. Marbles, you'll know about marbles and there were a range of games that we played. Higher and higher. This was a simple game where two people held a rope and we used to compete to see who could jump the highest. Strong horses. It's a game to developing scrummaging skills for rugby and simple games played in the open air. Wartime sights. There were many things that we saw in war times, wartime which we don't see today. Any place of importance, such as a dock, or a port, an oil refinery, industries, factories, would be protected by large balloons, enormous balloons, as big as your, the classroom that you're sitting in. And they would be on a, on a long wire, strong wire, and they'd be floated up into the sky. The idea was that any enemy, air, any enemy bombers come along would fly into the wires and would crash. I never heard of that happening. We also had things called emergency water supply, which are large metal tanks, again about the size of your classroom, one meter high, circular in shape, and they were dotted about the place. These were filled with water like huge paddling pools. This meant that there was a ready supply of water available to fight any fires. That was called an emergency water tank. Convoys. Now a convoy, you can have a convoy of ships, which means lots of ships, usually merchant ships, traveling one behind the other, and they would be supported by warships, destroyers, to protect them. But you could also have convoys of lor lor lorries as well. And they were usually used to carry soldiers from one place to another. And very often we would stand and watch 30, 40, 50 lorries driving by in a convoy. We also used to see a lot of American soldiers. And we were very, very pleased to see these because they always had chewing gum on them. And we used to go up to them and ask them, have you, have you got any gum, chum? And that was a stock phrase with us all. Searchlights. Ports, docks, and these places which had barrage balloons also had searchlights. They were enormous lights that shone brightly up into the sky for miles. The idea being that they would try and pick out enemy aircraft that were coming to drop bombs on us and to, to light them up so that they could be shot down by ak ak guns. These were guns which were again placed alongside the searchlights and alongside the barrage balloons. ACAC stands for anti-aircraft, and those guns would try and, and shoot them down. My mother-in-law had some soldiers working in an ACAC station just behind her house. My mother-in-law was very kind, and most evenings she used to feed all these soldiers in her own house. Very kind, very generous. Wartime spirit. In wartime, people helped each other out as much as possible. There was a feeling that we were all in this together, and most of us pulled together. We call this a wartime spirit. Neighbours would keep a watchful eye if they knew that the man of the house was in the forces. Those who had food would always share it with others. No one went without. Children were looked after by other people at all times. Everyone trusted each other. Communities would try and cheer themselves up. And finally, street parties. I mentioned earlier that there were no street lights. When the war ended, 
I remember everyone becoming very excited because the lamps were to be switched on again in the streets. That night, the streets were packed with people of all ages, enjoying themselves after years of darkness. Despite all the food shortages, every street held a party. Tables would stretch from one end of the street to the other, and jelly, cakes, etc. would be enjoyed and games organised for everyone to take part. There's one little piece that I'm going to add, which is not in my notes, and I want to tell you about this shortage of food and how, how surprised we were with things. If you have a school fair, I expect you have a big raffle. And I would imagine that your raffle would have good prizes like bicycles and telephones, tape recorders and all good things like that. I can remember a raffle in our school, which we got very excited about. Everyone took part and everyone looked forward to winning the prize. And the prize, you'd never believe, was a banana. We were so pleased to see bananas because we had never seen them before. That's the end of my little talk, children. I hope it makes sense to you. Thank you.